Thank you to Herman Marshall Whiskey for sponsoring another episode of Suds with Luds. Herman Marshall produces small batch, handcrafted, and award-winning whiskey, patiently aged in new white oak barrels. Whether it's their Texas bourbon, Texas rye, Texas single malt, or their blended bourbon whiskey, all are built from the grain up, just like good whiskey should be. Make sure you ask for it by name. Thank you again, Herman Marshall Whiskey. Well, welcome into another episode here of Suds with Luds. Uh, today, we have a special, special guest. I always say that, Maxie, by the way. <laughs> Jason Maxwell, who has been with Bauer and Easton for 20. over 20 years, Maxie. Going on 21. And so, welcome, first off. And if you don't, if you're one of these people that listens to the podcast, I get it. I would suggest today that you may want to go to YouTube or whatever and try to watch this one because what Maxi has done today is brought in some tools of of the NHL guys. And so we've got sticks and skates and gloves, and we may even get some scoops on a couple prima donnas in the NHL. And um, but you can you can learn some stuff here um, today, and hopefully hopefully we have some young kids listening to this too because i think there's a lot of information when it comes to sticks and skates and that so maxi welcome first off thank you and uh i want to also thank uh herman marshall here for being a partner with us and i'm sure we'll go down the herman marshall road today too maxi um right, since you've already got a beer in front of you um <laughs> Let's uh, tell me a little bit about let's let's talk about Maxi. I mean, you you were a goaltender when you played, right? Yep, I was. Um, started you know age five from upstate New York area, but uh, you know played you know all the way through uh, junior in the USHL, and then uh, you know some minor minor pro stuff and West Coast Hockey League, and then a little pro roller. I got roped into roller uh, hockey. And this, it was kind of a summer thing back then for guys that were playing like in the A or the coast. Yeah. It was a little way to go somewhere nice like LA <laughs> and collect a small paycheck and um, get everything else paid for for your summer. The only thing you had to worry about was getting hurt and going back because you're on wheels. Did you go to college? Uh, I went to school just while I was in the USHL, but just uh, we either had to get a job or we had to, had to go to college. Yeah. So I just took some college courses rather than okay. uh, getting a job. So Well, let, let since you were a goalie, I love these questions. Um, I like to know the answers, I guess, to the now, questions. Now, there's still a lot of players that I deal with that don't know that I was a goalie, so hopefully they don't see this. <laughs> it's not going to affect you working they, they, with them? They think I'm an unreal shooter out there, right? That's why I tell them anyways. <laughs> well, we play together. So you actually, you're my partner sometimes, <laughs> I know, I know. Too. You, you've we, seen we, it. We do live by, let's go out and slow down the, the world's right. fastest game. We That's can slow right. it down, and we can shut people down. But what was your uh, what was your goals against average? Oh, it was low, Letty. It was low. Yeah, it was no, low. No, like when I was in the USHL, which was, you know, you know what it is today. It was um, kind of the up and coming junior league in the US. Yeah. The other one was uh, was the league in Michigan, which was CompuWare and all those guys was was getting smaller. USHL was getting bit, bigger, more of a college prep league. Uh -huh. um, and uh, I was based in North Iowa for two years and. Uh, did really well. Just you know, had a lot of uh, a lot of um, you know college teams interested Any in me. Any scholarships offered? Uh, I had I had some opportunities from like Providence was high on me. One of me. my boys went I there. I think they were. Uh, that's right. I think um, Terrari was just moving out. Yeah. And they needed a starting goal. Anyways, to to, to make the long story short, um, I moved back to L.A. where I was at some point with my family, my parents, and all that, and. Um, you know, just had a girlfriend there and, and kind of didn't really hang it up, but wasn't really interested in, in, uh, in going the college route. So, so just, what, so, okay. So now how did you, did you come right out of that into getting into this or what did you in the so interim? He, here's, here's what I did was I, I was back in LA and I was playing hockey there just kind of in the summertime. And I, you know how hockey players, they all it's like a melting pot all the yeah. all the good ones get to a, you know to a certain spot and so that was the case there and i was uh, i was skating a lot with the kings in the summer okay so i became you know pretty close Contacts. with uh, with robitaille and yeah. steve duchene who you know uh who lives here in dallas and um eventually those guys started uh you know 99 showed up into town and uh 
uh, hockey was booming in LA. So those guys started up a business and they were building uh, training facilities, ice rinks. Yeah. Each one of them had a, you know, a nice restaurant in it, two sheets of ice out, out West. There was a roller as well. And then they, uh, they had, uh, you know, pro shops or nice stores. So eventually, aside from hockey, I, I started working for those guys and they were building, you know, six, eight, eight of these rinks around the U.S., and they hired and what me. What capacity were you working for? Uh, they hired me to do uh, to do all the pro shops. Okay, so that's how I got into the this this business. But um, and uh, when you say that, you mean like order all the products? Yeah. And- so I would I would start it off at the one in California, which was their training facility for the Kings Isoplex. It was called, which is still there, but it's a new name now. They they sold it all out, and um, uh, from there we we did one in the Bay Area. I went up there, opened that one. What I did was open the store, hire the staff, train them. And then move on to the next one. Mm-hmm. Uh, along with that, I was always helping them build their program. So I was teaching, you know, kids because they're all places that hockey was fairly new. So they were trying to build it. So from there to, to the Bay Area, Bay Area, they bought one in Escondido, San Diego area. Took that one over, you know, hired, the, hired a new staff, retrained them. Uh, from there, moved on to Tucson. Brand new facility there, same thing. I was there at these places anywhere from, you know, three to six months. Uh, Bay Area was there for a long time because that was their first, yeah, you know, one other, other so than speak. LA. And then uh, the next the next stop was uh, was here was Dallas. So, you, I, you, so you were in some pretty nice markets. Yeah. So I, I, had, I had no complaints, and I was you know in my in my uh, early to mid twenties going to all these uh, you know these different places and, and spending a lot of time there, and then you know, we opened up Dallas and that was kind of their last one. And, um, so I think I was, I was working at that one for maybe two to three years. And then, uh, you guys had just won the cup. Mm -hmm. And so it was obviously starting to boom here. The kids getting involved and, and I was at that rink in Addison, which is where the store was. Mm -hmm. Um, you guys were at Valley ranch. So then, uh, somebody from the stars came to me and asked me if I would be interested in, um, in doing, helping them with their expansion for all their retail. And at that point, Robitaille and Duchesne, and those guys were kind of tapped out or, or, or done doing that, what they were going to do. And so, uh, I accepted that job with the stars and, um, you know, we did all the different facilities that are around here now. So Euless, I think was the first, yeah. first one that we did. Um, in Duncanville and then, you know, blah, blah, blah. So yeah. I did that for five years. And, and from there, what I, I was the buyer, right? So, so this is how you're making your, you know, was Easton the first company then? And that's who you yeah. ended so up getting in. I was buying from all these companies and, um, always had a really good relationship with, uh, with Easton Bauer as well. But, um, and the Easton guys, you know, I, I made a little, uh, a little deal with them one year. They, they said, okay, you know, if you increase your numbers this next season mm-hmm. by X, we're going to take you to uh, on a golf trip to Maui. So I think they were just using me, but yeah. uh, well, they didn't really care if I increased my numbers. But we went on that trip to yeah. Maui, so <laughs> that's all that you cared about, right? <laughs> um, but yeah, so then then I believe that there was uh, either a lockout that lockout year. Yep. Remember that? Oh yeah. And so then it was like you know, all right, what's going to happen here? You, you know, you never know. But we we were doing well. The stores were doing well and everything, and uh, you know they were half half hockey stuff and half merch, you know, retail yeah. or merch stuff. Um, and the stars came to me with an offer just, uh, and, and I, you know, it was a great timing and, um, it was to do pro and a little bit of retail around this territory. So I started off with the stars in Nashville were my two teams to start. And then I had some retail stuff as well to do in college. Um, so from there it just kind of evolved and I eventually became, uh, you know, the manager of, uh, of the pro department and, uh, as well as calling on, on my team. So I, I, at some point I probably called on, you know, 28 of the NHL teams and there's only a few that I didn't call. I never called on directly, but, uh, so I had gotten really around the whole NHL to, to develop the relationships with the equipment managers, obviously. And, and then, you know, th- then the players and, um, it was a great time for Easton because, you know, two th- in 2000, is when they really launched the one piece composite stick, mm-hmm. the synergy. And, uh, every I just pl- wondered how good I could have been with uh, that. I mean, it was the year after, I mean, you, you had, I could have got you had the three shaft. goals a year. Yeah. You had the shaft and the wood blade. I mean, <laughs> had you had just that extra little piece of composite on there, Letty, you would have been, 
you got another 10, I know, year, now, another 10 years. I quit 25 <laughs> years ago and I shoot harder now <laughs> than I did then. How did you go about like j- learning about all the products? So, you know, the sticks, the shafts. Yeah, and I mean, uh, these companies, they have... Did you have to go to school? And or, it's weird. or did you just hands-on? No, we, we have, we have you know, engineers and, and product people that develop the product. And, and the funny thing is, I was thinking about this earlier, when we go to these, these meetings as reps or whatever with our, our company and our developers and designers that, that are making this product, we, we want to know about it, right? Um, sometimes they'll give you 10 things to talk that mm-hmm. they want to talk to you about about these this technology i might bring three of those things to an nhl player because they don't want to hear all that they want two or three things that 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 you know really catch their attention would they ever would they have ever brought a player in to say what are you guys looking for and or do they just did at the time they just want the finished product i mean no we we do we've done it before we have brought players like at east and our our stick factory was in mexico okay near tijuana well, oh, so okay yeah. so so this is a weird thing yeah it's not like going to you know cancun or, or cabo or anything um we would literally fly players into san diego you take them out to dinner wine them and dine them the next day our stick guru would uh pick us all up at the hotel in a van and take us you know they had special crossing of the border because he worked over there you know so he had okay. a pass so he didn't yep. have to wait in that big line that people wait in and now, we, do the NHL GMs know about this stuff? I don't. I don't. I don't think they do. I'm just wondering if they they were okay with their players going across yeah, the border. Because if, if you'd have seen what I saw driving from the border to the factory, it, I mean, it looked like the place was had had just been bombed. Uh huh. You know, it it was crazy, and and you never know yeah. down there. So so we're like you know beelining it. It's like you see in a movie. You know, they they get get across the border and they're just going 100 miles an hour, and then Did you guys boom. drive across, you swim across. <laughs> we, we, we drove, but. Okay. Uh, but anyway, so we yeah, we would bring players down there, run them through the factory, show them everything, and you know, I mean, they they could really they have ask. any good input, or were they just N- along for the not then, freebie? not then they didn't. They were just checking it out. Well, what was, guys first off? Uh, so so those that era, okay, we we started signing players like, uh, and these became all the the patterns that you know today. Okay, um, so Sackick, Iserman, Ronick, Heatley, Madano. Um, that era of players, those were the guys that we, we were paying. Uh, Stevie Y, um, Gabarik, you know, players like that were guys that we would bring down there. Okay. And, um, you know, and that's that's where we got all of our patterns, Shanahan. Um, and t- to this day, I don't, I don't know if I'm getting getting ahead of our, our We've got no word. We, we have no plan here, so, so you the, just go. The number one pattern to this day is is the old Sackick. I was going to say, I think that's what I would. Which I is think what that, you're using yeah, now, which yeah. is called the P92. Yeah. Um, so everybody's, you know, just things have changed throughout the years with uh, endorsement deals and uh, and how stuff is sold, like on a shelf. We don't put players' names on the sticks necessarily yeah. anymore because you, you might have a two-year endorsement deal with them. And maybe maybe after that second year they don't re-sign with you, but there's a bunch of their sticks left in retail stores, and they're kind of they're kind of either no good or they got to sell them or you know put them on sale. Uh, it could create something you know something weird sometimes with a player, but um, and the the life span for a for a stick model is two years now. So every two years it's changing, something's changing, just like golf. So the pet, can, can you grab the socket? This is where we want people to tune I just in. Just happen to have stuff. one right here. Oh, there you go. So, so now, this is P92, which was the old socket. Have you ever known with these sticks, these composite sticks, many players that actually try to curve them, put their own? Because I yeah. know who was the best at it, in our opinion, was Zuby. They do, and, and he was yeah he he was a guy that then can come up a little later in our which, conversation. What stick did Zubov get? Uh, he was a stealth guy. Okay, and he had his own special pattern, so it wasn't something that sold at retail. Uh, Zuby was a guy that new new sticks so well i couldn't i couldn't pull any fast ones on him you know Uh like like we we can do that today not not for for the wrong reasons but sometimes too much information for to these guys will just confuse them even more you know and and they don't need to be confused when they're i thought now if i'm listening to this which i didn't know and if zuby has his own pattern why would he always be in the room with the electric heat gun curving it again i know that's just that's just how some guys never come to you guys and say hey this isn't right always not always but but he did many times you know and and if i made him something and and like the weight was off he could tell 
you know, nine out and of ten. One, and players. how much would it be off? Do you think? Oh, a, 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 a few grams. grams. So grams, like you know, five to ten grams is the weight of a dime. Yeah, you know, and, and he could tell. He could tell that stuff. And those are the elite players. We're and talking I couldn't about. lie to him. You know, because yeah. I knew he was right. Yeah. Because I could look on the back of the stick, and it would tell me. We put a code codes back there. Uh huh. And I could tell the the weight of the blade, the weight of the shaft, and the exact flex. And we didn't want players to know about that, but eventually it got out. But they still couldn't understand what the codes. So a code could could tell tell me that the blade was off one gram, and they'd be like, "This is no good." One gram only because they f- see a code on there, and it's different from their oh, other one. Oh, okay. I, and I would be like, you know, Brad Richards. I'd be like Richie. I go. It's a gram, one gram. Do you know how much that is, Richie? <laughs> yeah. You know? Well, wait a second. He may go, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. But, uh, you know, so we, we we just deal with a lot of that stuff. And uh, But anyway, Zuby was a great guy to work with. Yeah. Love that guy to this day. He was definitely one of my favorite guys to always work with. And he got mad at me at times, you know? Like, we get some breakage problems or, or something would happen or he was in a slump. Had a, you know, had a bad... Yeah. Yeah. game or two um and a lot of times they they blame their equipment they can blame me their rep of course and uh and that's when things aren't going well no points are yeah. coming and yeah i, I want to get into that later like how many times you get calls from guys but so explain the socket curve if you could i mean um if you're, so, so this, describe this curve was uh it's really just a, a mid curve with a little bit of open at the toe and, and it's just a personal preference on curves so there, there's no curve that really you know, with the exception of like, you know, something that they're teaching today on, on how guys shoot. Mm-hmm. They're teaching a technique like how OV shoots. Um, and that is really relying a lot on the technology of the sticks. And um, So you're saying you can actually teach people how OV shoots. And they, they and do that. And you can become the next OV? You, you, yeah, possibly, you know. Okay. I mean, if, you, if, if that's your dream. But I'm, I'm telling you, these, these instructors now... I don't know where they all come from because they might not even shoot like that. Mm-hmm. Um, but they, uh, but this is how they teach guys to shoot now. So when they teach them this technique of shooting, it's where they pull it in really close to their body, and then they they lean on the flex, and then they let the, the flex does a lot of the work. The, the correct? stick does the work from there. So there is true technology in hockey sticks, and it, and it does work, and that that actually makes sense. Whereas before, you know, this technology or this style of shooting, um, it, it was different. Like you, you didn't really, you know, know other than, you know, the the feel of the stick, mm-hmm. the shaft shape or whatever was to you. It, it was more of a personal preference, you know. But now, if you uh, if you go to this other style, which would be hard for, you know, a guy that from back in the day, ten years ago, um, to to use that type of a curve or to to move to it because guys were using heel curves, you know. Um, our, our most our number two most popular pattern back in the day was we call it the Drury, which was a heel curve with an open toe. Yeah. Um, probably now in the NHL there might be three or four guys still what use would it. That why would a player want that type of a curve? Um, so that that curve is really good for you know passing, receiving a, a pass. You get it close to the heel, and then they uh, you know from there they can when they shoot the puck they can shoot it off the toe. They can, you know, they can toe drag a little bit um, with, with that style of a curve, but um, it, it's just really a, a feel thing, you know. And you can get off a good backhand with it because it's not. It, it a doesn't big have curve. a big bend on it. Yeah. So with uh, with a newer curve like the Ovechkin style, it's just this big toe curve. And when I when I tried one of those, and, and truthfully, again, I know I mentioned it earlier, but the guy that's kind of created all this was one of your old teammates and he was the guy using a 70 flex shaft with a big toe curve okay brett hall remember he was the first guy to use that really whippy thing and everybody was like and you you saw he would lean on it it was nice to watch it in slow motion yeah and and like i would see him shoot from the corner like near the goal line you know at the goalie where there's usually no chance but the way that thing would whip and it would go high you know it was just hard, hard for goalies to pick up on it. So, is is Ovechkin's shaft as whippy as Holly's was? Pretty close. So that they they're really um, leaning on that whip that comes off there. Now, from the standpoint of that that toe curve, is that where he's hitting it? Because it doesn't seem like is that where the puck is is striking the stick is in the 
toe curve itself. So, so with Ovi, and let me grab a stick. We got an Ovi down here, I'm assuming. So I, I don't know if, if this can be seen, yeah. but okay. you, you can see that, that toe curve. Okay. So when he shoots the puck, uh, if he's just, it just, I don't know how you control that. If he's skating in and he's doing a snapshot on the move, it comes from here. Okay. Yeah. But when he's taking one timers, those are coming from out here. That, okay. That, that was my question yeah. is like where he's hitting it at. Yeah. So he's not hitting it from the toe on a one timer. Yeah. Um, but, but when he's coming down, I mean, obviously probably he's 50, 50, half the time he's shooting a one time or other time he's coming in and just f firing a, a laser yeah. snapshot. Yeah. Um, otherwise he doesn't do any other shots, you know, and the flex is the same as what Hollies would have been. Yeah. So he's, uh, he, he's been bouncing around anywhere between like a 77 and 82. Okay. Um, and, he, and he's a big boy. Yeah. Yeah. He's you know? learned he, two and a quarter I mean, at least. I mean, I know Holly oh, probably was he's more than that, isn't he? I know. Yeah. Yeah. I know Holly was, you know, a bigger boy, but two, but not, he, not, he had a lot of yeah. display stone yeah. here. Not, like not, he was not big, well like, balanced. not big, like OV yeah. style. Um, yeah. So that's how they're shooting these days. And they're, they're teaching him to shoot like Ovi does his snapshots. They bring it in close to their body. They lean on the shaft mm -hmm. and then they release and, uh, and, and the shaft does a lot of the work. So are they coming in when, when you talked about guys going down there and going through the plant and things like that, how are they, how are they getting their points across from a flex standpoint? Like, is it just trial and error? Or so then, these? then it was really, really hard, you know, like we, we would give them a few things to try and they would, they would go with what felt the best. To okay. Them. So we, we just, um, now obviously technology has, has gotten so much better. Uh, we have an R and D facility up in uh, Quebec and in there we build our pro skates. Um, but also we have, you know, a stick section, a helmet section, um, and, ev and everything else that we, that we do. We do testing, you know, for helmets up there. But long story short, we, we run players through there all the time. Mm -hmm. And um, we'll bring them in there. We have a, a small sheet of ice about the size of this room. And um, we hook them up to all sorts of stuff. You've seen it in the golf industry where they're trying to mimic the yep. golfer's swing yep. and all that. We have all the all that stuff that we do and we do all, the, all this testing testing so it's based off really how the guy's shooting and um then we listen to what he likes so we just had in uh, i guess i could probably say it but um huberto yeah he's obviously off for the summer um he's been a ccm guy for a long time and he's never really been a tweaker hasn't really tried Is he much staying in calgary um i think so pretty, pretty, well they fired the coach just so yeah, he yeah, could exactly stay. great okay yeah i don't think he's going anywhere now yeah <laughs> um but but so so we we videotaped him we analyze it with our stick guru and and then he comes back and says he looks at all these different points and and again like you can talk to this to, to these players you can tell them 10 things they, they might catch you know three things out of those 10 and um so from from what we did with him yesterday, he came back to us with what he wanted and what he liked and what he liked about a CCM and what he didn't, and then we we build him sticks based off of that. So now he's a passer. Yeah, I mean I think that's his strength as a passer. Are are they a different kind of weird than a shooter when it comes to their sticks as far as the flex versus the pattern? Not really. No. No. Um, you know, like Max Domi. He, he's a great passer. Yeah. He uses the P92. Um, just a, you know, a regular flex. Obviously, you know, the shorter you are, the shorter you usually cut your stick. So the shorter you cut your stick, well, the, speaking stiffer, of that, the stiffer do it you, gets. Do the sticks come their length? Or do they, they do don't. they want them do they want to cut them themselves because i know sometimes some guys do. Are like oh, i needed a, a quarter of an inch longer. Yeah, some do. And at, at Easton we would we would cut the sticks to the length of the player's choice. Okay. Uh, we currently at, at Bauer we don't. It just um, it takes up a lot of time in the factory when you're when you're just trying to pump out sticks, you know, and and meet lead times for these guys to mm -hmm. to get them their sticks. So we will make a standard length of sixty inches, we'll say. Then we'll make a plus four, a plus six, and a plus eight for a hawk and puff. So like the Charas and Olexiaks. Those guys. Now, what is the, isn't there, a, is there still a rule as far as there, length there, of sticks? There is. But they, they get some kind of a pass. They do, unless, unless you're some height. freak of nature or whatever. Yeah. 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 Same same with goalies. I know. Well, what I, what I know. is the standard? Can't be any bigger than um, this stick. I, it would probably have to be 70 72? inches. 72? 
Yeah. 70? Yeah, 70 okay. inches. And so what would a guy like Chara versus Jamie Oleksak, what, what do you think they're using lengthwise? Um, I mean, Hakenpa is at, at a oh, 68. 68. Okay. You know, and, and that's that's pretty good. I can't remember what Chara was using at the end of the day. It was longer than that. I oh, do yeah. remember because we had to get approval to yeah, build it. Right. Um, and I don't think Alexiak has anything uh, uh, out of the range of, of where it's supposed to be. Let's uh, let's talk about Patrick Kane. What what is, and then we'll we'll get a little obviously we'll get a little close to home here with a couple of guys here. Is is how is Patrick Kane's model when it comes to kids? Like, is is the I'm just wondering. Can you give me the top three when it comes to I don't know whether it's college or or below. Is there a specific pattern that? Yeah, it's still the P ninety two is one. Okay. The P twenty eight, which is the big toe hook. Yeah. Um. And then from there, it, it's really those two. There, there's a distant third, which is a P88, okay. um, which was uh, like a Madonna, old real Madonna curve. So you know, remember his similar to what yeah. you what you used yeah. to use probably um, with different results, but yeah, definitely different. It's like I, I have everybody's curve like in my head from uh -huh. all these years still. Uh, but then from there, we, we'll make a bunch of variations of these popular patterns. So Jamie Benz is a P92, and he has a little flip toe on the end. Yes, which he did by himself with yep. a with a torch at some yep. point. Yeah. Um, but normally, like even with Zuby, we talked about that earlier. When they start to heat them up, they usually break. You know. Right. But Zuby was the master at that. He could get it just a little it bit took more him forever without. And he yeah. had the touch with that heat gun. And, and the worst thing though is when when he grabbed a new stick and he and the equipment manager's watching him curve it, yeah. and then you hear it snap. They're like, oh. So what about these, what about like the Patrick Canes, the passers? Yep. It surprises me that they don't have a flatter blade because because the passers, I look at Panarin, Kane, you know, you can go down down the line with some of these guys that you would think it would be a straighter blade so you can make the backhand passes. So there aren't many that use that anymore. I don't know. I just saw a, uh, something on social media in regards to Leon Dreisaitl's curve. It's a really big it, yeah. paddle. But it's, he, it's like this. And it's pretty straight. I, he makes passes like rockets on his backhand yeah. from, from the right side of the ice to the left side of the ice. Yeah. Like it's a rocket. I mean, there's not many anymore. Like the, these guys are using that just half of the blade, okay. that area to make their passes, you know? And that would be if it's on the backhand, it's closest to the heel, you know, and then to the yeah. middle of the blade because they're not doing it from the toe because it'll roll right off, right? Because yeah. of, of the curves. But, but Patrick Kane has never changed his curve it's the old easton shanahan it's it's fairly straight for the first three quarters of the blade you know and then it's got a little bit at the toe and it's a square toe but he's just used to it you know the last one before we talk about a couple of stars is ryan o'reilly it could be the ugly ugliest stick out there is that made or does he put that little hook on the end of it no they, they make it for him they like make that. that yeah because um you know between him uh, and you remember LeClaire used to have something weird like that too, mm -hmm. but also, uh, you know, one of my favorite guys that I've, that I've dealt with over the years was Duncan Keith and Duncan was, um, pretty psycho about his sticks and, uh, he had a little wedge in the bottom of his blade, bottom at the toe, which wasn't like a, a full notch, you know, it's not something he would break it, you know? To, to make that curve and then we would send it in and try to make a mold of it and we finally got it down eventually but it was really oh. hard to make a mold like that but we got it down eventually um but his his was a, a, a unique one but it was a pretty pretty straight curve and had that little corner and i think he he felt like he could dig pucks off the boards with it like that uh, you know okay and i think that's where where jamie ben likes that flip toe that he has yeah um which is actually one of our our uh our curves that we offer on uh, my bower which is something for kids that can go on and pick curves it's gotten really really popular to have that little beak toe we call it speaking of popular and maybe not so popular what's the deal with the one with the <laughs> yeah so with, with with this line with i don't what do you actually call it because it I, I i never got it so so this is um this is a is this a, is this a mistake no though no th this is not and when when we come out with stuff like that we um as pro reps we're like okay is this a gimmick? Because if it's a gimmick, then then we're not going to bring it to the NHL. Right. And so they came out with this. Unfortunately, it got kind of killed by COVID. So it's a you know a two year life cycle. 
right at the beginning or just before COVID, we came out. We we had gotten some traction with it uh, mm -hmm. in Boston, you know, because it's close to our our, our head office. Um, DeBrusque was using it. Anyways, long story short, it, it's called Sling Tech, and what's it called? It's Sling Tech, and and we'll still make it if Sling a guy in the garbage if can? a guy wants it, but. But nobody's really asking for it anymore. But the bottom part of the blade. What was the why? Why was the concept come up with? Yeah. So the bottom part of the blade has a technology, so it's more forgiving. Uh, so you get catching passes and things like that. Really for catching passes or for shooting. Okay. So so sling. You think of a sling yeah. slingshot. Slingshot. Yeah. And then and then the the middle part, you know, helps definitely take some weight out of it. But it what also middle part. It's empty in the or, middle. Yeah, the hole. <laughs> but and then the, then the top is really rigid, right? Okay. So this bottom part from here to here is extra, extra, you know, cushy. Yeah. So that was it. Sling so tech. it had nothing to do with the weight of a stick. No. Is, is it, you've heard that then too. Yeah. Like people wanted to lighten it up. Yeah. And guys wanted, they're like, I don't want to tape over it, you know, or like you can tape over it. It's not to do with aerodynamics or, or it definitely helps with, with weight for sure. But it was just to separate a softer material from a more rigid material. Is there anybody using it? Um, I don't think anybody did. Anybody is, no. use it for a period of time? Yeah. Oh yeah. There, there was were. there was about six or eight guys using it. What was it the feedback start. on it? Um, I mean, it was good, but and and truthfully, like I think uh, DeBrusque just went through a slump. Yeah. You know, and then COVID happened, and then when they came out of it, it was just kind of disappeared, fizzled out. Okay. So. So that you can get them for a good price now. If there are any left, yeah. If there's any left, there's one right here. Yeah, <laughs> it's for sale. And and, and this is <laughs> some that, lucky. We'll give that to some lucky winner if they yeah, want to write and, in. And this is that P28 curve, which is the, yeah. big, the big toe. Anyway, so so talk to me a, a little bit about dealing with some of the players. Does it end up? I mean, about being the sticks' fault or the skates' fault? I mean, do you get those phone calls personally? Yes. Hundred percent. Can can you give me the? Let, let's start with the top three that you would say are uh, picky, and I, I'm assuming they're goal scorers. Yeah, well, not not necessarily, but uh, I'm gonna I'm gonna go from a, a pretty good range of, you know, from current to some mm -hmm. in the past, but um, a lot of them are just guys that that you know like a lot of attention. Uh, and and a great example was um, when PK Subban was in Montreal. Yeah, you know, he PK. likes attention. He loves yeah. the attention. Okay. So he was, you know, he was just becoming a thing and and we would send him in his sticks. I was with Easton at the time. He'd get in 24 and he would reject 18 of them. He'd go through them all and reject 18 of them saying these are no good. Couldn't say why. He would just say these are no good. And are you guys there at the time? The a lot of times, Right yeah. away he's yep. checking them? Yeah. Okay. So he kept six out of that 18. Okay. And I'm looking at the codes on the back, right? going like okay these are all in spec you know like yeah. nobody could tell not yeah. even zuby um and so we would take the sticks out of there rebundle them up rebundle them repackage them send them back in and he'd take out 12 of the ones that he said were bad and say these ones are good and those six are no good so <laughs> we so we didn't we don't like to do that but yeah. you know when you're dealing with a player like that and there's nothing wrong with the stuff like we're not just going to let him have well he thought we did but um, did it? Did did that ever happen because of his performance at that time, or not necessarily? Not necessarily. Okay. It, it just kind of a mood he was in, you know. Yeah. And, uh, and and how he wanted to, you know, be perceived around the room with some of the other players, like yeah. like he's the real deal or a big deal. Um, but I but I know that uh, Tarasenko does that. He rejects ton of his tons of his sticks. Um, and 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 there's guys that are just simply playing bad you know mm -hmm. so they look for something to blame um and some of them some of them are great about it they like they'll see me and they'll be like max i know it's not no i know it's not my gear so do you find that when a, if there's that type of a player would they blame it more on the sticks versus the skates or yeah. gloves or is there a S sticks it's 100%. always a stick right i mean it, it does happen with gloves um we're getting a little bit of that with a couple guys it does happen with skates um I, I did. I do want to mention to you. I, I got clearance to uh, last night. I ran into uh, Brendan Morrow in the in the hallway there. Yeah. And I said, "Hey, I'm I'm doing uh, uh, suds with Luds tomorrow." And I go, "I just want to get your permission because I might your name might come up tomorrow." Mm -hmm. So he's like, "Oh boy." He's like, "Maxi." He goes, "Whatever, you, whatever." I, he goes, the good I don't news care. is now he's got to come on with the show and defend yeah, himself. Exactly. Okay. So I, I said, uh, "I said." He goes, "What are you going to say?" I go, "Well," I go, "When you were when you were playing, he was the captain." 
and and maybe you were going through a little bit of a slump, uh, the equipment manager Sudsy, Sudsy Sudsy would call me in and give me the give me the situation. So I become fr- from there I become the uh, you know the shrink. I don't come in with any gear. Like I know what I know what it is. It's he's just not playing well. Right. So he just wants to ask you some questions. So I'd come in, you know, when, the, when they've lost four or five games in a row, and I would just stand there, and there would be like a line. Like a conga line? And they'd all come by one by one, and, and they'd have a question for me. But, but Maura would come by, and he'd be like, Max, he goes, did you, did you change anything in my sticks? I go, no, not a thing, man. We haven't changed a thing. He goes, all right. He'd be all, all bummed because he's hoping he could he blame. Was hoping that's what he, he was could, hoping he could blame yeah, the sticks, okay. you know? Yeah. Um, so so I, I do a lot of that. And, uh, you know, for certain players, Duncan, Duncan Keith was one of them. Um, you know, now it's, it's, uh, 91 on Dallas is he needs a lot of, a lot of that. Like, well, he needs to use the same stick that he used last night because he, he had a hell of a game last night. You know, but, reassurance. Yeah, we're, we're doing this this episode, by the way. And last night was game seven. The stars are moving on now. So, yeah, so it's really, it ends up being at the same guys that we would think it would be. I would assume that it's always the top players. And um, what about skates? What what about? I mean, how picky? And, and I can set this up by from my college days, a couple of years in college, and then until I was done playing pro. And that's what twenty something, whatever it was. I had four pair of skates. So compare that to some guys now. Yeah. So so this is on skates and sticks, like. The usage is, um, we pretty much have an average, I'll just say sticks really quick, average is about 100 sticks per year per player, not including so playoffs. So just over one a game. Yeah. Um, then you got a guy like Spezza who has three sticks per game no matter what. Uh, and if you're a rep and you're on commission, you do whatever he wants. Um, so sticks now with some of these superstars, Ovechkin, Tarasenko, uh, seems like it might be a lot of russian guys but um they're they're using you know four to six sticks a game and, and but are they breaking on there's them? literally nothing wrong with these sticks when what happens them to them when they so so let's say the, let, let's i don't know is there anybody like that in dallas currently um well not that bad uh the heavy users in in dallas and these are guys that aren't hard on their sticks necessarily yeah. but but just like just like a new a new twig you know saggy uh ben uses a fair amount of sticks okay so let's let's say that different type of players one of those though. sticks brand new stick tapes it up brings it up obviously they they test their sticks in morning skates right yep test it in pregame sticks are good to go they got four sticks sitting there suds so you got four six five six whatever it may be they don't like that stick what happens to that stick when they don't like it do you know? Team takes it Does back. Does it end up going in the pro shop? Yeah. It okay. goes it, it goes a lot of teams nowadays. Well, if it's game used, that most of the teams sell them themselves. They resell sure. them because they're paying us yep. for all these sticks. Uh anyway, so so average stick stick user was hundred sticks per year per uh per season. Um and, and now there's you know players that are up, you know, two fifty, three hundred. Uh last stick I'll tell you about is two fifty, three hundred per year. Yeah. They're using okay. And that, that really translates to a lot of dollars. And, and we're sports marketing, the, us pro reps, so we're not sales guys. But at the same time, you know, we kind of are. But uh, Tampa ordered Kucherov 70, uh, 72 sticks just for the playoffs. Okay. Well, you, you brought it up. So, so spin off on that. Do NHL teams, they did at a time. I don't know if they still do. Are they? Do they have stick budgets? They do. Wasn't there a year where a play, I don't know how many years this went, but players were only getting x amount of sticks a year or dollar amount per year is that right so yeah they tried that but then but didn't then fly th- with the players it, it didn't because how do you tell you know tyler sagan sorry you, you've reached yep. your yep. limit now you're gonna have to buy the rest of your sticks it just doesn't doesn't work so do you know well obviously you do know can you give us a ballpark on budget uh, stick budgets for teams and are um, they different or is there is there an nhl thing that says no max is this every team so has, every team sets their own stick and skate budget yep. things like that and if you happen to have uh lou lamarillo as your gm you're in trouble well if you have lou as your yeah there's a lot of things that happen with lou and yeah okay he, he's really tight tight yep. you know with the budget and uh, hey it's not a bad thing um well, you it know, is for the superstar players. Yeah, that yeah and, and I used to deal. I had New Jersey um, when Lou was there. I had them for a couple of years and I had a couple of big boys there back in the day. Uh, Parise is one. He was one. He's still playing, obviously. Um, 
but you know he he's a really great guy great player to deal with uh a little quirky with what he wants and what he likes so we call him a tweaker you know because mm-hmm. they, they just like to change little things and and these little things take a lot of time to do for us yeah. you know we, you know make yeah. a mold a week then order sticks two more weeks and anyways long story short uh it, it was just really tight in new jersey you know uh and some of the some of the teams have an equipment manager who's also maybe getting incentivized by staying under budget so they're they're working like you know for the for the gm yeah. as opposed you know and you know how these equipment guys are they're, but do, do they get like at the start of the season when they do their budget do they say hundred thousand dollars for sticks this is what, what i don't know what that number yeah. is but oh yeah 100 percent. are we in that am i in that neighborhood or is oh uh, no because you know dallas would spend fifty thousand on spez only for sticks oh lord yeah so what can you give us a ballpark like what, um, what some of the teams well every everybody's different like i I, w- I can tell you that um vegas toronto tampa colorado dallas you know as they've all had pretty large budgets like, yeah and i'm thinking only for the company that i work for you know so i don't know what they what they spend on ccm or mm-hmm. i mean I, I could i could do the math yeah you know, based off how many players use those their products and, and Warrior or whatever. But, uh, you know, I, I mean, some of the information I'm probably not allowed to reveal. But, yeah. but, you, but you know, like, they're, they're paying close to what you would buy a stick for in a store. They get, they get a little bit of a, a break because really? they're, they're higher volume. So if a stick is, you know, 300 in a store. Um, you Time, know, times 100. Yeah. For one that, player. That's for one guy. Okay, so, so you, you guys out there are smarter yeah, than me. They can, you can they do can, the math. Yeah, they can do that math. Um, uh, now you know. So so moving on to skates. Skates is uh, it's another thing. Um, all of our skates, 99 percent of the players wear a custom skate in the NHL. Yeah. There are a few guys that wear a, a stock skate right out of the out of the store. You know, um, which is great because they can get them really quick. Um, so take, take take them take our listeners through the process when they get a pair of new skates. What a player does. Yeah. So, well, what what we do first of all is we we come and we fit the guy. We have some some fit stock skates, uh, just for them to try on. We also have now we have a, a a scanner, a 3D scanner that they stand on. It takes about eight seconds to scan your feet, and then it pumps out something on your iPad that shows a, a 3D model of of the guy's feet, and then that goes right into the cloud. Our our uh, factory downloads it. And they build this guy's skates based off the scan. So every little bump, mm-hmm. it's built into their skates if they want that. Um, which most guys we do scan and we go that that route. Um, but some guys prefer, you know, their skates to fit a little bigger, a little smaller. Um, like well, so all coffee. A, yeah, exactly. But but if a scan says you're a size eight, and you've you know you've been a junior, you've been wearing a nine. You're, you know, you might not be comfortable in an eight. So right. we, we got to listen to that. And, and I've, I've gone through that over, over the years with uh, some players coming out of the Canadian Hockey League and also a lot of the players coming from, um, from Russia. They, they just, in Russia, they don't, they don't get a lot of service over there. Yeah. So uh, like, you know, Val yeah. uh, Nikushkin, for example, he came over with. So they're easy to deal with or they're, oh my gosh. Let no, me, no, let me. they don't get a lot of new. So they don't want a lot of new. That's me. And yeah. and they were old stuff. They were not properly fit. So they're wearing skates that are two sizes too big. So for some so you're saying they're more low maintenance then? Yeah, usually. Uh, but eventually if they get they get the taste and they've been over here for a while, it, yeah. it you know, and depends, they make up for it. Depends who they're sitting okay. next to in the locker yeah. room. So um you know, so so there's a lot of that going on with them and, and I've refit a lot of them and, and over the years, a couple guys, uh, Drew Dowdy, Tyler Sagan, um, Mike Camilleri, just just some of the random guys that I know that were fit incorrectly in in junior, and I've scanned them. I've looked at what like they're wearing a skate that's over a size too big, you know. And I'm like, okay, so here's the deal. I let them know. I go, just so you know, and and this is this is the downside to wearing something that's too big for you on the ice. You get all sorts of uh, problems can can come out of it, and performance, and then yeah. also breakdown of the skate. Um, so I, I've gradually brought these guys down to a smaller size without telling them. Um, and and I work in cahoots. Do with, they ever? I work bring in. It up ca- to you? I, I will. After, you ever bring it up to them? At I some do point? after a while. Yeah. So so me and Sudsy did it to Sagan, and we we brought him down over the summertime. We brought him down like a half size because his skates were way too big, you know. And he wears a, a huge skate as it is. It's like a size eleven and a half now, and he was a twelve. 
Um, who, who, Tyler? Yeah. Really? So, so me and Sizey. But you're saying that's too big for him? Yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah, it was big. I mean, ideally for him, like his two feet are the different sizes. So we'll just say he, he was in a 12 and he should be in an 11. So we brought him down half the size over the summer and didn't tell him, you know, right until he's like, yeah, everything's great. Skates are good. Blah, blah, blah. We're like, all right. And then, you know, later on I'll be in the, in the, hey, by skate the way, room. yeah, by the way, you yeah. know, we, we brought you down a little bit, yeah. you know? So, um, you know, and he's like, thinks to himself for a minute like you know i I don't want these guys to not ever trust me sure because they they need they need to be able to trust their rep and um not all of them do but um can you tell us what a what a skate weighs uh yeah on average skates are probably in the uh 800 gram range can can you do something that's not from your um you need a calculator I, i would say a pair is probably four pounds now what would that be different from 20 years ago yeah, definitely. Skates were, were they're made out of composite now. Skates back then were made out of leathers and nylons and um, just a lot of heavier materials. So everything now it's uh, composite internally. It's synthetic or lightweight foams. Um, Do they break down easier now? Then uh, not, not really. Like you know, if you if you look at it, like this stuff is. And but you're it, not. I don't understand how guys get hurt anymore with these this stuff. And they're wearing extra protection on the outside of those, yeah. but so it's really hard to break that down. Uh, so leading into the to the topic of usage on these, there are some guys that wear one to two pair of skates a year, uh, and then there are other guys that are wearing twenty five pair. A well, year. Let's talk about those guys. So, what's the craziest guy? Um, are we well, going to see one of them this next round with the Dallas Stars? Um, well, there's a couple on Dallas, but but none Not of them. About Vegas. None of them compared to the one to one on Vegas. So um maybe maybe three or four years ago buffalo requested a new pair of skates for every game for eichel every game every game so 82 pair of skates is is he wearing a different pair of skates every game or i mean i don't i don't know if we ever got to that family members no 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 they're definitely all for him um and it was legit like he was wanting a new pair every game and uh he just got used to that new feel there's nothing wrong with the ones when he's done Mm -hmm. um so mo- moving on to like you know for for Dallas, so Sagan's a pair every four games. Wait, let's back up to Eichel for a second. Okay, maybe if you're listening to this podcast before the next round starts on Friday, you might want to make up a couple signs that it just kind of hey Eichel, hey Jack, how are your skates feeling today? You got a pair? I don't know. I'm just throwing that out. There. Is that a new pair? You might need a new. Yeah, pair. You might need another pair. So, okay. Now, just on those skates, do they have to put them in and bake them or anything like that? Or they come right out of the box and they wear uh, them? You don't have to bake them, but we, we recommend that you do. It'll just but loosen. these guys that are wearing skates every day, is that? Yeah. So, they, they, always, they, always, they almost, 9 out of 10 would bake them. Okay. And, and, and really, Explain that's. Explain bake them. So, I. Yeah. So, we have, we have ovens um, that we use, you know, in, in the hockey industry to bake skates. And we put them in the. Uh, in the oven for at 200 degrees degrees for about five six minutes and what that does is it loosens up the inside materials so they mold and conform around your foot but they're already molded to their foot to start with correct the boot is the, okay. the hard stuff yeah that so you're not getting any pressure points from the hard stuff but the inside stuff there's some memory foams and stuff that um that when you heat them up it just softens them up a little bit so those mold around your your feet a little bit quicker and um, just give you a quicker, more comfortable mm-hmm. fit for right yep. away. Game ready. Yep. yep. So really, really, these skates look like they're a lot stiffer and harder to break in than skates were 20 years ago, but they're actually easier to break in. Now, talk to about the blades because we're seeing a lot of players because some people are what the hell's going on with that guy as they're crawling off the ice. Yeah. So th- there's a lot of <laughs> there's a lot of stuff going on with holders and steel these days a lot of improvements um in technology a lot of profiles that players are are tweaking and trying um but but prior to uh you know this edge holder which bauer had developed um i don't know we'll just say it was six seven years ago um prior to that the holder and steel the only way to get the steel out is you had to take the whole thing out rivet by rivet and then you could replace the steel with these two screws. I mean, that's that's a. So when you, you know, break, when you used to break a blade, you're screwed. Yeah, it's a, a half, that's a half an hour job yeah. for equipment manager yeah. at, at best. Yeah. Um, so so Bauer came up with something called the trigger, and you pull it, and the, and the steel comes right out. Um, so this this was a huge 
game breaking oh. thing for for them and bauer was the only one that had it csam recently came out with their version which uh has hasn't seemed to catch on you know uh so there's a lot of guys that you'll see wearing a ccm skate but using a, a bauer holder oh. out there um so the ones that were you see popping out that was the previous holder bauer has just come out with a new holder which they've improved that so it usually it's when they get hit back here in the heel. Yeah, pops it can pop the steel out um, on the previous holder. So this this whole new holder coming out for next season, they have fixed that that problem. So you'll oh, see so less of it. They're, they're still I was going to say because they're still popping out, but coming next year. Yeah, this new one we shouldn't will be see available. Any, or the players shouldn't yeah, see them anymore. It should be a lot less. Because it is less. kind of funny to watch them. Oh, you yeah. never know what the hell is going I on. I know, uh, but but sometimes the steel will break. Right in the middle, yeah. you know, which is happy. You take a hard shot off that, you know, yeah. anything can break. So, um, so that, but that's different than, than the steel popping out. But yeah. So yeah, the steel has become, um, you know, a, a bigger deal in the NHL and each player is probably using. Uh, how many, how did the trainer, like how many pairs of steel would it, just one extra pair, would you say during a game or what? Are, no. So now, now especially when they're on the road, not at home's different, but on the road. Right. So every, every team has their own little, uh, way of, they, they go about doing things, but, most of the players are probably using 12 sets of steel during the season. Uh, San Jose is, is one that, you know, when you're down there before on game day, morning skate, equipment guys are just sharpening away. Now they, they do it all at home, but they a lot of them have machines that do it all for you. And all you do is you just pack the steel and away you go. So rather than getting to each city and having to resharpen skates all the time, they've got 12 sets in a box for each player. Talk There's, about a taint, time saver for the trainers, uh, right? It's huge. And, and the funny thing is, and, and, and we're, we're now heavy into the, uh, to the steel business profiling, and we, we actually bought a, a skate sharpening company or a profiling company that does all that stuff too. And, and it's like I'm going in and, and talking to teams about this and – you know, you have some younger, younger generation of, of equipment guys, mm -hmm. and then you got some guys that have been around for a while, i.e. Yeah. Sudsy. Sudsy. Um, well, some of them just, they just don't like change. Sudsy, by the way, uh, Steve Sumner, the Dallas Stars head trainer, is going to be calling her quits after 20-plus yeah. years, and he's coming on. What other show to come on than Suds with Love? I, I, I know. He, he, should be, he should be right in here yep. when, when, they're, uh, when the season's over. But, yeah, I, I did talk to him this morning. I'm like, Suds? retirement could have been today yeah but so he, he he's pretty pumped that they're that they're moving on but um but yeah he'll, he'll be a good one for sure you know uh i mean the info that i have you know he's got it times 10 uh, on these guys well, talk a little bit about trainers like we we were closely have to with, these guys. with them to try to get players into certain stuff and like is there is there that kind of a because again like you mentioned earlier from upstairs, they come to the trainer and say, hey, so-and-so is using too many of this, whatever it may be. Yeah. So I would assume that, do you have to go through trainers sometimes to use your products? If they're, say they're using a different company's product. A player? Yeah. No, not not really. Like, like our job is really to get with a player directly, and then the player tells the equipment guy what he wants to use, and mm -hmm. then, the, then they cut us a PO and the team buys it. But there, there are so many different little things that you could do to piss equipment guy off that, that you don't want to do. So we have to be in constant communication with them, you know, because if I go in and I switched, uh, you know, a, a player well, out because of Because the player is going right directly to the trainer, right? They're not, are they, are the players calling you when something? Most, most of them. Okay. Well, they, that... they have us on speed dial okay. and they don't hesitate <laughs> to text me or call me at midnight on a Tuesday night when they just got, you know, well, you're not home anyway. So what's well, the difference? But yeah. they, they do that. It's, it's Tuesday night. They're on the bus after they just got, whipped yeah. by a team and they need a vent yeah you know i mean i could show you some of the text messages that i get from some of these guys that i that i considered friends <laughs> 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 but when, when their stuff isn't right or they don't feel like it's right man they and, and, and a lot it was really tough coming out of covid because all that supply chain stuff but so stuff was hard to get you yeah. know but uh but I, I got a real doozy from from Braden shen in uh st louis i mean he just he just Ripped India gave me the gears. Like I'll never get rid of that text, but um, he was is just. He, is he still a customer, or is he, he still he is, using he the is, product? He is. He is. Yeah. We're great. Like, I, well, don't I, they understand that you could delay a product? You, I mean, not that you guys ever would, but and you can't do that because yeah. that you know that's a losing. That's a losing. Fight. I mean, I mean, some of them don't. Some of them get it. Like some of them totally get it. Yeah, and some of them don't get, it, or they get it, but they just refuse to. You know. Yeah. 
Um, but, but yeah, no, it was a skate thing for him and he's a, you know, pretty heavy user and, and, and I'll be honest with you, man, when you switch models, you know, uh, to a new model, like these are every two years we're changing something, you know, on skates. Why? Uh, is it you or the players that want it changed? No, it, it sounds like you just open up another one. It's the, co it's the companies. Like we're just like any golf company. We got to come out with new products for, for the consumer. You know, these kids, they want new stuff. They don't, they don't want to buy something that's, you know, old technology. So always trying to improve it, make it lighter, you know, stronger, faster, whatever it is, um, in all products, you know? So on the skate thing, I asked you this earlier, and I'm just trying to grab a couple glasses here. This is a Herman Marshall pit stop. Um, why, when you've got who I would say 99.9% .9 of the hockey fans on the planet consider uh, Connor McDavid the best player on the planet, right? Why are there Jordan shoes and Kobe shoes? And I'm, I can't believe I just named two basketball players because I'm not really a basketball fan. But why does Connor McDavid not have a, a branded skate? Because it seems to me like as a kid... They, they would all go to the parents, and they're going to think they can skate like Connor if they had Connor skates. Yeah. Uh, there, there's a few things. Um, one is, is hockey is a really, really small industry in comparison to other sports, and it's not growing. But um, two is since we come out with a new product uh, or new models every two years, so we have two model skates, and we stagger them, right? So every year we have a new skate coming out. It's either a Supreme or a Vapor. Is that a marketing thing? um you can say yes. yeah i mean some of it is yeah. but well, makes sense. I mean, but but some of it is definitely new technology uh so here, here's what happens you get some of these players you remember russ martin yeah russ would do this on the show all the time <laughs> <laughs> he'd always do that on the show <laughs> um okay. but but some guys don't like change right so all the sticks that we we sell out there like the one with the hole in the blade we know I mean, I, I was if I was a betting man, I, I was going to bet that that one wasn't really going to resonate with NHL hockey players, and and it you know for a couple of reasons it, it didn't. So okay, that might have been a okay that was might have been not a great launch for us at mm -hmm. Pro at retail. It was fine, kids loved it, um, but we we will always make a player, and they don't they don't always believe us, but we will always make a player a Patrick Kane or even a third line guy their same old stick that they've been using since kale mccarr he uses he's using the same stick he used in college it's heavy it's a log all we do is update the graphics um we just don't want to keep selling old graphics of something you can't get anymore right that's old uh but so so back to mcdavid and the skate thing so i'm assuming he's in an old model that they don't want to market because uh -huh. you can't get him anymore. I haven't really looked at his skate lately to see which model well, he's what in. What brand does he wear? He's, in a C he's a CCM endorsed okay. athlete. Uh, but you you will see some other players. Um, have, you know, you, have you guys, your company, approached anybody with that? Can we put you, your name on a skate? Oh, like, not not really. I mean, I think for us, is we don't, we don't need to. We, we own most of the skate market, you okay. know, or a, a big portion of it. Um, we put the players' names on their skates for them, but yeah, but we don't market a oh this is you know Patrick Kane skate because mm -hmm. he's in our vapor skate. We we just don't need to do it that way. Are there endorsement deals anywhere uh, anymore? I mean, do you guys? Yeah, yeah. It's so, not like it used to be where there were a bunch of players. No, right? so all those names I I, I said earlier, uh, those Easton guys, Mo and Heatley and Iserman, Sack, yeah. those were all endorsement deals with those guys, and, and we we had like. The best of the best, you know. Yeah. I mean, we didn't have you because you were too expensive. But you know what? You know what? I got a pair of skates when I was in Montreal. <laughs> I was endorsed by them. You remember Orbits? Hey, yeah, yeah. I got two hundred and fifty dollars. <laughs> hey, hey, Ludwig, we'll give you two hundred fifty bucks if you wear our skates. Like, yeah. Sold. Hey, Montreal, <laughs> Montreal. You wouldn't believe what, what those guys oh. get paid. But um, so endorsement deals right now are, are, are pretty rampant in the NHL. They're a lot smaller than other sports, but um, all the big guys have one. And I, and I'll tell you that. You know, we we have different guidelines, and and we rank them by you know market the market that the players in. 
So A, B, and C markets. Dallas, so Dallas Toronto, B, and C. Toronto, Montreal. Toronto, Montreal, That's the number tier. one and two. Dallas and two. It's three. C. Dallas is in three. Okay. Um, so so you, you base that off of you know location, enrollment, and hockey. Yeah. I mean, I, I know Dallas has done a great job of, of growing hockey around here for, for youth, um, but still C market. Um, there is nothing lower than the C market? No, not really. What do you I put mean, Arizona in? They're, they're C minus. How, how's that? <laughs> okay. Uh, you That's know. a college market. Yeah, yeah exactly. Um, so so you look at the market a player's in. If he's going to be a, a, a Connor McDavid, the market that he's in is not going to matter because he's he's a, likely we call it a global athlete. Like He's recognized all around the world. Um, Ovechkin, Crosby, uh, you know, prior to that, um, you know, Mario and those guys. But And, and Gretzky was – you know the big guy that Easton signed, the the chrome aluminum stick. Uh, but that was that was like one of our one of Easton's first endorsement deals was uh, was was Wayne. But so long story short, right now, pretty much nine out of ten players is getting something from uh, an equipment manufacturer. So nine out of ten players they're getting something, but but not necessarily very much. So what we, what we do? I thought you were going to say nine players in the league. No, no. There's there's the the global guys, uh, the McDavid's, the Matthews, yeah, yeah. and on Kane. Oh, yeah, okay. Kane's still one. I mean, as they get older, you try to bring Is them down Hintz, a little bit. Robertson, Haskinen, like Haskinen's going to be coming up. Somebody's got to be knocking on his door, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, obviously, that's up to representatives that mm-hmm. they have. But yeah, so a player like him. Um, in, in Dallas, uh, you know, might, he's a, he's a CCM endorsed athlete. I don't know what they pay him, but I could probably guess. Um, but if he was in Toronto, he'd be getting probably, you know, 10 times as much as what he's getting here. What do you think Matthews gets? A guy like Austin Matthews um, in Toronto. So, so there's, there's a lot of parts to these deals. Uh, they would get a base and then a bunch of performance bonuses. What do you mean by performance bonus? Just like a regular NHL performance so, bonus, goal scored or things? Or yeah, so a, a good example for us would be um, Kale McCarr is a is a Bauer guy, and uh, I can't really tell you what we pay them, but he made you can nobody listens. He, to this he made show. <laughs> he made about twice as much from performance bonuses a year ago when they went when they won the cup when he went out yeah because what he won the Norris he won the you know yeah. the, so are, the performance do you guys go by visibility in other words if they get to this round to that round to that round no but if they but if they win the cup or go to the cup they get a bonus okay all right um so the, the top players in the in the nhl let's let's just say it's probably only three three guys might be getting you know a deal and these are not bauer guys of north of three hundred thousand dollars you know from a base Mm -hmm. and then they get performance bonuses wow so totally different than a nike shoe deal where they're making millions you know um so you know how hockey is like every year you look at that number one draft pick and and then so so connor bedard yeah so the kid goes well he hasn't yet but he's going to be first overall chicago's you know wins the lottery is is he going to instantly he's going to make 750 grand i believe it is for the first three years right Will he get an endorsement deal? Have you now? Is he already is he already under contract with somebody? Being, yeah, so he's not, and and they're they're oh, so you're on the hunt. They're 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 being smart about it. Um, his agency is really being careful about it because it's a big deal now. Because uh, the requirements from the manufacturers, they're not just hey you you get on the ice and score goals and we're going to cut you a check. We we bring them in. We bring these guys in to uh, what we call athlete event. It, it's in the summertime. We bring in you know, seven, seven, eight, nine players of guys that we're paying. And we do all this content shooting mm-hmm. over, you know, one to two days, eight hours a day, which they don't like to do. Two days for the money you're getting. I'm sure. You can, yeah. You, you, you would think, but, it. um, and then we, we capture all the content we need to. And then we, we use that for marketing for the next year and a half or whatever for those guys. Um, so Bedard, uh, as soon as their playoffs were done, they had each company come into Vancouver and do some sort of a fitting presentation type of thing. Really? So that would have been five companies, um, and we just did that a couple weeks ago. And, you know, we we went pretty pretty much all. He already uses our stick and skates. He's using that really light stick. You guys are the leader in the market, though, am I correct? So, so in the NHL, yeah, in the NHL, um, a good way to gauge is we keep our own track of our own stuff you know but a good way to gauge it and what's what's pretty accurate is gear geek it's uh it's a website you can go on to and they stay up to date 
by by the night pretty much on what every player is wearing okay. um and, and they're pretty pretty savvy they, they can tell they've learned some stuff about our codes and stuff like that they could say oh looks like patrick kane is using the same old stick but he's got a new graphic on it you know so they're, they're getting pretty smart and we might share some intel with them every now and then but um so gear geek if you go on there we're pretty right now we're number one in all categories uh we're not in helmets but we have the number one helmet out there but overall they have more helmet guys and, and we just went through a helmet sort of revamp a few years ago so we nixed all the old models which if we had those old models still we'd by far you know be the number one so mm -hmm. those are all gone and we came out with three new models and so helmets take a little bit of time but but anyways yeah so so we are but uh back to bedard so yeah we all flew in and um, we did a full-on presentation like for his parents for the agency on how we're going to market him how we're going to build his brand uh which could lead to more endorsements for him sure. right so they, a lot of people don't understand that um so and this is this the same this is a special player this is yeah. a connor mcdavid at least that's what the projection will be mm -hmm. uh, the 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 mcdavid the matthews you know regrets obviously uh kucherov is it just for that play? I mean, do you take the top five picks and do something like that? Or is it all just the number one pick? Or is I it mean, just kind of go by the generation or the player? I mean, Luddy, so, so you see the draft every year. Or you see what, what the, the projections, projections are. Yeah. are, right? So right now, one, two, and three. So one is him, Fantilli's number two, yeah. Leo Carlson number three. Um, are they getting the same treatment as Bedard, two and three? Big difference. Okay. Big difference between three and one. Okay. One three is a D man. Unfortunately, yeah. they don't care about us as yeah. much as they do yeah, the know. forwards. Yeah. Um. So no, definitely not. Like I think uh, I think, and everybody thinks that Bedard is that special next yeah. special player. Yeah. So we 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 don't disagree with it. Um. You know, everybody has their opinion. Uh. You know, I I think I know where I I feel like he's gonna what type of player he's gonna be. How much input do you have on all that, or is there? Um, I mean, I mean, we have, we have a lot. Like w when we get to this type of a player, yeah. Um, it's I I so I manage the pro business for Bauer, but and I, I answer to Mary Kay Messier, who's Mark Messier's sister. So she's a VP of marketing, and then you know, and then from there it's it's uh, really CEO. Everybody they're all involved in mm -hmm. this in this situation, but um, two and three. It's between you know me and and Mary Kay and and my rep, one of my reps who handles prospecting. Uh, so it's like that. But but the the number one pick's always a gamble. We're paying them big money for probably we're gonna we're gonna come out of the gates to a three year deal. What? So when these deals happen, and I don't I don't want to jinx anybody. Can can a deal ever? Is there an out clause? Yeah. The, I'm, the, I'm, the I'm assuming for both sides, but does it have to be agreed upon or if has, there's has something to be bad upon. happens off the ice yeah, no, image wise? It, it has to be agreed upon. Something like that happens. That's, that's a to that you can, uh, you can definitely, um, amend the contract. Right. Uh, so a, a couple funny things though is, um, you know, there's always a games played clause in there, but yeah, you could like, if the player said, look, they just can't get my gear right. You know, and, and I'm not going to lie to you, man. Which, I, can they say that and just try to get out of the contract? They could. Yeah. We could make it difficult if we know that we're making them really good stuff. Yeah. But if you're if you're maybe, you know, so I, I, I went through this with Jamie Ben once when I was with Easton. Um, and he started out in Easton. I think he started out because everybody on the team was in Easton, you know? Yeah. So we felt like he had to use it. And uh, eventually, okay, Benny became the captain. I'm like, all right, buddy, let's, let's do this, man. He was... Um, I was taking him cause he switched to Bauer. I was taking him back and Easton, we had a really weird skate at that point, you know, and he just couldn't do it. It was that Mako skate. Um, not many guys used it, but he just couldn't do it. So the, the deal just fell apart at the mm -hmm. last minute. Um, and I, and I do not hold it against him. You know I, what I mean? I was going like, to say, I kind of nah. like that because it wasn't about the money. Or, no. or whatever it may be, right? Yeah. It was because he just liked this yeah. certain thing. Yeah, I mean, you can offer me twice as much. I'm sorry, but yeah, I'm we just, had a relationship. You know what I yeah. mean? So it's big on relationships. But um, but a, but a funny one is is you know the the number one pick, unless it's a poor draft, like unless you know it's sure. a poor draft, yeah. which has happened in the past. But the last the last few years, you know, like the top guys have been studs. You know, Jack Hughes is one of our guys. Kid in Montreal. Uh, so that was kind of a surprise thing. So so the the funny one though, you know, and. And this is uh, Lafreniere. Yeah. So he was the next best thing, yep. you know, since Hasn't Kane or whatever. Hasn't turned out that well yet. 
Yeah. So we we cut him a huge deal. <laughs> yeah. I mean, he was in a good market at least, you yeah. know, for us. But yeah. but now his deal is up. Um, and he's going. Are from, they calling you? He's going from trying, this, Letty, uh, okay. to this. So, but are they now? Are, is his representative contacting you and saying, "Hey, let's get a new deal done," or are, is he smart enough to know? Okay, no. So that that process usually starts right around now. Like we we okay. we we start, you know, mostly negotiating contracts June first. That's that's when our next budget start. Mm-hmm. We've got it all mapped out. We're like, okay, we're we're just we're going through that process right now. So we we've already got him basically at near nothing mm-hmm. so now we got all that money we're pumping into you know the other guy the new guy yep yeah so anyways uh you know bedard's going through he's collected all the information from everybody testing all the products right now and uh, when is the, now do you do, does the market say we need a date by a certain time obviously in order to get stuff ready for him right yeah, is that is that date coming up? Yeah, it, it's got to it's got to be here here pretty quick. Like, we gave um, one agency a deadline for Jack Hughes, Posternock, or the Hughes family, Posternock. The uh, Hughes family. Yeah, we got we that got the would whole be family. a big one too, right? Yeah, I so, would assume so to it, get it's all like, the. It's like one of those deals. Like we have and the, the dad's a GM. I mean, yeah. Does, does the dad get something out of this too? Uh, As a general manager in Montreal. No, no, no. Nothing, no. You can, nothing you can say. I mean. Like Drew Doughty, for example, all of his endorsement money he gives to his dad. Okay. So, who knows? Well, they can do whatever they want yeah, for it. They, I just didn't know if yeah. if a father, and especially you know, as a general manager of an NHL team, can do that. I don't even, you know. But but yeah, yeah, I, yeah. I would assume like it, the it might stalls. Not be legal. Yeah, the stalls. They, the they've stalls, been great. I mean, can you imagine? Like, I know we don't want this to happen. Um, but I mean, you're looking at the, the, the stall brothers, you know, as a, as a family and the one that I thought was the youngest one, is he working for a hockey company? The stalls? Thing? Yeah. So, the younger brother? Uh, he's, they got four of them, right? Yeah. There, there's one that's but not playing and I, I, I don't, I'm not sure what he's doing. was going to be doing. better than all of them, yeah. but apparently he's done. Yeah. Yeah. But, uh, but they've been, you know, they've been a, a, a good family to deal with. Uh, uh, Eric you know and jordan are two guys that i've always had you know hands-on stuff with for for many many years and they've been great to deal with and they're they, we've been gradually it's really hard to bring them down you know mm-hmm. there's some there's an ego thing with a lot of players sure you know and, and some they're, they're like i get it you know uh and, and it's great when you get that guy that gets it because yeah. he's not going anywhere but, yeah. but some of them like you know it's really hard but uh kucherov was such a, a problem to deal with with his gear he wanted stuff that we don't make he wanted his own stuff like like we talked about earlier so we finally made him an all black skate which is what he wanted an all black stick which is what he wanted and um with no uh, representation of the company I mean, on we, it? we it's like tone on tone so we put it on there but oh. it's real hard to see yeah uh so it, it's not great for us but right. but we could turn it into something at you know at retail and say okay we're going to launch kucherov sticks a one-time thing an all black bower stick we sell them out in a in a hurry mm-hmm. um but he but he came he became a, a real problem to deal with you know from from everybody he just got really demanding and sometimes it's best to walk away from those type of players yeah. and I, I i tell that to some of my reps i have a, a a newer group of reps i got some young guys and i said look you know some of these players that, that you're dealing with that you're the problems that, you, that he's having that he's you know telling you about and he's you know just a mid-level player or whatever Sometimes it's just not worth it. Sometimes you need to let him go. And and mm-hmm. I did that to to Duncan Keith. He became such a problem for me, but he was such a good guy. Um, he was just m- mentally, you know, messed <laughs> yeah. up about his gear. Yeah. Uh, he he was with his skates too. But I but I I said, hey Dunks, I said, listen, here's the deal, man. I have made you everything we have in our arsenal ten times over, and I, we have nothing else to make you. Like I can't do anything else for you. I said, I think what you need to do is you need to have, you know. A few of these, a few of uh, a few Bowers, and a few of somebody else on your on your rack at all the times, and just go with what what's working. And he did that, and uh, never changed our relationship. We're buddies, you know, mm-hmm. until this day. Yeah, like I'll reach out to him. You know, he's hiding out up in up in the mountains in BC somewhere. Those are the people you like dealing and working with, right? <laughs> yeah. Well, speaking, what, they don't want money. He never wanted any money. As a matter of fact, he really he, he was he was the only player in the NHL that tried to tip me. At the end of a season, what do you say? I, what do you say? Tried. I, I, you I can't accept it. I, I didn't want to accept just it. Just have to take you out I, downtown like, Rush Street or yeah, something like that. I'm like, Dunks, I guess this is my job, you know. But 
I guess I can say this now. I, I go, but the, the bad thing at the end of the day was he, uh, you know, like he tried to give me an envelope and I kept saying no, oh, yeah. no, 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 no. But yeah. then I packed up my bags. I was in Chicago and then I was on my way to the airport and he sent me a text. He goes, Max, he goes, he goes before you check your bags, he goes, you just might want to check in, the, in your stick bag. So I went in there and there was a, you know, a fat envelope. Nice. Classy and, guy. And it was $5,000. Classy guy, classy player. And I sent a lot of that money down to our stick guy to bring to Mexico to the factory workers because <laughs> they're the ones that were making the stick, that, the sticks right. for him. Uh, they, they, yeah. were, they were pumped about that though. Let's, uh, let's finish up with this referees. Do you, uh, different, do you guys rep the, Yep. are the referees under, can they use whatever they want? So or the, is the, re it? the referees are under helmet deal. Okay. And that's with not a, a non bower. We, we actually used to do the helmet deal with them and we would pay them. Uh, not the refs individually, but the refs association, uh, you know, a fee of like $30,000 or whatever. And we're like, all right, you know, this isn't doing anything for us. And mm -hmm. not, not like we don't want to take care of the, the officials, but we can use that money for something, something different. Uh, so they, you know, they did a helmet deal with another company, but I would say the majority of them are Bauer skate guys. And I'm the one that does most of them. So we have all their specs on file. Every summer, I have a conversation with them. The NHL basically gives them free reign to order their skates. They come through me, um, and we just build the NHL. Uh, so I, I get on the, the horn with almost all of them. You know, they they track me down at some point. I'm assuming way easier to deal with than most or, of them. Yeah, most of them are most of them are great. Is there a bad one? Ah, uh, yeah, I had one this year. Yeah. Oh, uh, tell me it's not Wes McCauley. No, it's not Wes. I've dealt okay. with Wes too. But the funny thing about Wes is if you look at his skates, they're they're probably about 20 years old. Yeah. But he still gets a new pair every year. So he must have a garage <laughs> yeah. full of them. Either that or he's- Christmas presents. He's got a pro shop in yeah. there or something. Yeah. Uh, but no, Wes is always good. And he, you know, he, he's based up there in, in uh, near Boston somewhere. So he's frequented our, our offices, which are about a, an hour out of- uh, out of town, up in Exeter, New Hampshire, from Boston. Do so, you go through the same process with the referees like you would with players? So what I can do is that scanner that I use, yeah. most of the retail stores have that scanner now. We've set, sent them all in these scanners. So if there's a referee or an official that um, calls me and says, look, I had, I'm having some problems. I want to try something different, blah, blah, blah. I'll just tell them to go into that a re, the closest store. They, they scan them. And then they automatically email you the scan. So he'll send me the email of the scan, and then I'll call him and we'll build the skates like that. And they just ship them right into them. Um, with the exception of, you know, uh, well, now I think just Gordy Dwyer lives here. And yeah, uh, I know I was, I was going to bring Gordy all. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So Gord, Gordy, I always get him done first. He was actually the first official that I made with his skates black and orange. You know, so I put some color in there for yeah, him to, yeah. to match his uniform, um, which we do that, you know, now. And it, it, some of it's subtle. You don't really see it on TV. But, um, uh, but yeah, anyway, so I, I do that for Gord because he's a good friend of mine. Can you uh, just vouch for these referees? I, you know, it seems like, it seems like every year they – I think the game gets faster every year. It gets harder for them every year. And – they're they're not in this to pick a side. They they do not want to be when the game is over, when it's game seven, or regardless of what game it is, the end result, they don't want to be a part of it. They they, they there is no hidden agenda here. They want to disappear after that they, game they do. is over. They just want to get in, get out, do their job. Yep. And and I know you have a relationship with some of them. And um different from players, I mean, I'm assuming I don't I mean I've met Gord a couple times, but Ego wise, Wes might have a bit of an ego, and and he's shit. He's what? He's probably ranked number one referee is he or some for uh, whatever yeah, reason. Yeah, I mean he's up there for yeah, sure. I mean, that's so, how they make each round right. and everything's like that. But yeah, um, you know they're they're different. They're all. I haven't really had any problems ever, with, with the exception of this one guy this year, and he's a, a younger guy. Uh, anyways, he just he had a bad experience. He got fit somewhere else, and we're we're, we're now we're making skates both in Quebec and in Asia. Um, our Asia factory is where they make all the retail skates. They pump them out. They're, they're great. Right. Mm -hmm. um, I feel like, you know, they've been as consistent or more consistent than our factory in Quebec. And, and that's just, just due to how 
how the labor laws and stuff are in Quebec right. as opposed to over right. there. Um, it's really difficult in Quebec at times, and especially coming out of COVID. But uh, yeah, but yeah, th- this one was funny. You know, we, we decided to go the route of making it making his skates in Asia because his specs set up to be pretty basic, right? And if it's basic, we're doing some NHL guys, a lot of AHL guys, CHL guys out of the Asia one because they're faster. Yeah. Um, and it's taken some of the load off the Quebec factory for the NHL skates. We'll, so we'll be able to make them quicker. But so his came in and he's like, uh, you know, I, I'm, I'm not going to use these. They're not, they're not made in Canada. Oh, no way. <laughs> yeah. So then I, then I got, I got that email from somebody at the NHL who handles the officials. And I'm like, yeah, you know, did you, let me, did you just take the sticker off and no, I, I mean, we, we can't, we can't do it. Unfortunately, you know, it's like, so did you make skates for them though? Yeah. Well, I basically, what I did was I ended up saying, send, I'm like, first of all, I said, look, I just got a pair of these skates. Is this, this guy must be, is he a referee or linesman? He's a referee. He, he is a ref. Yeah. But, he, but he's one of the up and comers, you know? So, oh, so he's not going to be roughing in the conference finals here. I don't know. No, definitely not. But, but yeah, he refused. <laughs> I to was wear, trying to narrow it down. Yeah. Like, <laughs> He, he refused, like, you wouldn't recognize his name, Luddy, oh, okay. but he, he refused to wear skates made in Asia, and then the NHL said, yeah, we, we, we want these guys to be wearing skates that are made in Canada, so that's going to be oh. a challenge this year for, you know, I, I, I don't disagree. I, I, I know what their reasons are, yeah. but um, so, you know, we, we basically, what I ended up doing is sent him into our, our factory in Quebec when they were going through and he was reffing in Montreal. Uh-huh. I sent him in because it's 30 minutes away. They had the day off, sent him in there. Our skate guru got him dialed in, and then he was perfectly happy after that. So, but they're 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 all pretty good. They're pretty easy for the most part. Occasionally, you know, when you switch models, yeah, it, it can be a little bit dicey. You know, it could be a roll of the dice. But the good thing is, we can send them back up there. If they're like, oh, they're about a half size too big, we can take their their current skates and reduce them half size without having to build them a new pair. So it's just called relasting. So um, takes a little more time, but but it's. Part of the gig, huh? Yeah. Well, Maxie, I appreciate There's a ton of info today. Um, I hope, uh, again, I, I would encourage people to to watch a little bit of this. Uh, maybe not the mess on top of the table here, yeah. but that's okay. We'll but clean that up. It is Suds with Luds. Um, thank you for coming in and sharing this stuff with you. You've been doing this for a long time, and um, I've got no personal stuff. I've got actually, you broke a stick of mine once, and you actually gave me a new one, which was nice. You yeah, that, speared that, me. You speared that, me. That, that's I did spear you. Yeah, <laughs> I, I did spear. You. We weren't on the same team. It was one of your anyway, little tricks. Uh, Chase Maxwell, I, I really appreciate it. G- good info. Um, I could do this uh, for another couple hours, but we don't have enough booze left here. So. Yeah, and and we'll we'll ne- maybe next time we'll we'll catch up on uh, some of the other products, gloves and, and helmet usage and yeah, stuff we, like we've that. Yeah, we've got so. uh, more. This there's a part two to this whole thing, and maybe right? Sudsy, Sudsy. Well, Sudsy, maybe we should bring Sudsy in here. You that would should, be great. The three of us should do uh, that. We, we Suds is already looking forward to. You know what Sudsy said to me? He goes, "Luds, I just want you to know this is uh, right at the end of the playoffs." Sudsy says again, "We're talking about Steve Sumner here." Um, Sudsy says to me, he texts me back and he goes, Hey, I just want you to know I'm working, you know, the playoffs before I retire. And he goes, so if I come on, I can't drink too much. <laughs> oh, yeah, he's gotta be- Don't worry about it. Sudsy. We're going to make sure yeah. your retirement show is being all done. Okay. Again, uh, thank you very much for, for listening to this show. And thanks again to Herman Marshall. Um, it tastes great. Less filling. Uh, another episode starts with Luds next time. Later. Thanks. Thank you to Herman Marshall Whiskey for sponsoring another episode of Suds with Luds. Herman Marshall produces small batch, handcrafted, and award-winning whiskey, patiently aged in new white oak barrels. Whether it's their Texas bourbon, Texas rye, Texas single malt, or their blended bourbon whiskey, all are built from the grain up, just like good whiskey should be. Make sure you ask for it by name. Thank you again, Herman Marshall Whiskey.